You're listening to the Packer Net Podcast Network. Survivor 46 is here, and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast, and we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Actually, it's the, it's the lead play on our in our offense. Tell the tackle to take the defensive end if he's over him. If he's not, we drive down on the first man who is inside. Pull back, we tell him to take the first man outside the offensive tackle. No one shows. He goes right by them and feels inside. If the YN has the linebacker taken out, he cuts inside. If the YN has the linebacker in, he comes all the way around. If you look at this play, what we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here and try to run this play in the alley. Hey, what's up, gang? Welcome into Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. We're joined today live on YouTube and Twitter. Our good friend, Mike Wall, former Green Bay Packer offensive line, now heading up process to perform. Mike, how are you doing out there in beautiful San Diego, man? Hey, good morning. Yeah, it's uh, tough to have a bad day out here right now. The weather's pretty good. Uh, we're right down the street from uh, about four taco shops. And so, it, as long as the food's good and I can walk outside and uh, barefoot, I'm, I'm usually pretty happy. <laughs> good stuff, man. Good stuff. I know you're on a tight schedule, and I just want to say thank you so much for carving out some time. Like I said, out there on family vacation and and decided to hop on here and talk a, talk a few X's and O's with us. What I wanted to do, Mike, was kind of jump into some of the uh, some of the game tape from last year, and we'll be very brief on these plays. You know, the Lions game, everyone says that leading up to that, that Detroit Lions game in Week 18, the Packers were playing a lot better. And then they came out in week 18, and it just, man, they they crapped the bed, really, I, for lack of a better way of saying it, right? I'm sure you've watched the tape. I'm sure you've seen some of it. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen here, and uh, and let's just kind of run through it, man. Let's kind of talk about it. And I've got down in distances, game situations. Just confirm, Mike, you can see that, that game film, right? Yes. All right, perfect. Okay, so this first play, and, and this kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with what we've talked about on the pod, Mike. You know, people see the yards per attempt by Aaron Jones and they immediately think, oh, the offensive line is just a beast at run blocking, right? But this is one of those plays that came in the first quarter. I mean, it was on the opening drive, and, mm -hmm. and he, he got nine yards. Aaron Jones got nine yards on this play. And as we look at it, to me, it looks like it wasn't very good blocking. It just kind of seemed like Aaron made something out of nothing. And I just want you to kind of talk us through this play. Again, it's a 12-ace pair, strong right, a little nine-yard run. I'm going to roll it in, give you some zoom effect here a little bit as well. We've got two cut-ups, okay? We've got, obviously, the all-22, which we'll zoom in on, and then we've got the box cam. But as we roll it forward here, you'll notice, to me, it looks like it might be a wide zone left. And first of all, it looked like Aaron canned out of the play. You'll notice in the box here in a second. And as we run this play forward, what kind of sticks out to you? First of all, what would you call this? Is this a wide zone left and he just had to cut back? Is it inside zone? How this, do you, is how mid zone. this is this is a mid zone play. Um, okay. You just in the way the easiest way to tell is is just the direction of the running back uh, where his where his action is immediately uh, as he's taking his track to get the, receive the handoff. So you see you see here. I think he's going off Bakhtiari. He's probably aiming for Bakhtiari's inside hip. That's that's where he starts. So in a wide zone on a wide zone play, you just pop it on the outside hip. Um, or you think about it from like a, a right there would be a ghost tight end. So they go, you, you might be, you might be aiming point for the running back would be a ghost tight end mm -hmm. in this situation. But because he's inside of, he's like in the, he's running kind of in the B gap. Start as you can see downhill here. 
Yep. And then he pops it back. Um, and what happens oftentimes in these, the, you know, we have inside zone, we have mid zone, we have wide zone, right? <laughs> and so what <laughs> what we tend to do is, is on the other side of it is coaches that we drop scheme, we go, oh, this is going to be in our mid zone package or our wide zone package. And most of these teams now have mid zone or wide zone. We don't really have an in. So there are inside zone plays, but not as as prevalent as, as they used to be. And the thought process is, I think initially is you're wanting to give it a bunch of different uh, looks that end up blocking very similarly. And then the only thing that changes obviously is the path of the running back. And then obviously, and then some of the work because of the, of the matchups you're trying to create with the offensive line. Got it. But it's all about reps, right? And so it's about getting your reps down and being really automatic and precise, accurate with your footwork, your body position and your hand placement up front, because these all of these plays where no matter how you dress it up no matter what formation you're in what motion you go into at the end of it the offensive line really has outside zone footwork which is going to be foundationally 100 percent the same 100 percent of the time or mid zone footwork in this case which is going to be 100 percent the same 100 percent of the time and there's a little nuances i'm talking foundation there's little nuances depending on is, is it a wide three technique? Is it a tight three technique? Do we, you know, what's the difference between for the left guard, if you play, if you have a two eye with a slip call or a gap call with the center versus a, a, a wide three technique, you're, you're obviously your footwork's going to have to change a little bit, but those are the things we always practice. So you get as many reps possible over and over again. Got it. Got it. Good stuff. And, and like I said, you know, it, to me, it looks like Aaron, I mean, right here, Aaron Jones is already having to kind of abandon the play, which I got to admit, you know, Aiden Hutchinson, he, he looked like a beast to me last year. And he really sets the edge well here against Bach. And uh, yeah, as he cuts back, it's just like there's not much there, but somehow he gets nine yards. You know, um, we're going to talk about running a little bit as we go through these other plays. Mm-hmm. Again, I don't want to get hung up too much on one play, but just want to kind of use that as an example. of, Hey, there was a nine yard gain. But when you look at it, you know, he was really kind of contacted there in the backfield. Um, all right, let's move on to the next play. This was kind of crucial. Um, I, I'm sure you remember them going for it on fourth down with the jet sweep. This was the play before, right? And and everyone was screaming, why in the world would you run a jet sweep on fourth and one with, to, to Alan Lazard? Uh, I'm mm-hmm. sure the coach has seen something, right? I'm sure there was something they seen in the game plan. But the play before was actually a third and one. There was 9-16 left in the first quarter. Packers come out in 11-gun tray. They got an F wide right. So basically what they, they did this the whole game against the Lions too, Mike they would flex out the tight end, Tunyon, way out wide. And I don't know if they were trying to get a backer to walk out on him or what, maybe trying to identify man coverage. I'm not really sure. But for mm-hmm. whatever the case, they go to a running play here. And Green Bay's leading at this point three to nothing, all right? And so this is obviously going to be a no gain. I want to just kind of walk through this and tell me what you're seeing here with the offensive line. You know, the first thing that sticks out to me is, I mean, it, to me it looks like probably a mid zone, right? Am I thinking right? Mm-hmm. All right, so we got a mid zone play. And you can see it. I mean, it's just it's just stopped cold. Third and one. Let's go behind in the box cam here. What do you think went wrong on this play? Because it just seemed like Detroit was one step ahead the whole game, man. I mean, it was every time we tried to run on a third and short or a second and short. This is what you've seen. What okay, sticks so, out? Yeah. Uh, so the first off, if you look at this and you start, you were talking about you know how sometimes yards per carry in this league are deceptive, and they're having a running back issue right now, obviously with the contracts because of it. They're six in a box right here. Uh, if you just look at the at, at the immediate uh, immediate screen here, we got six players in the box. So this is the easiest situation to run in. Maybe that I mean, Amon Green never got six in the box. If we got six in the box. He'd average <laughs> eight yards a carry. This is a joke. Okay. So what's happened here is there's a couple guys winning individual matchups. Um, what happens on mid zone more often than not is um, you said this earlier. Like Aiden Hutchinson, his like the job of of Bakhtiari really isn't to create the space as much as it is to make sure the space is not taken away. And the, all the work is on a mid zone play is really going to be done by the the, the guard uh, back to the backside tackle, getting that some some at some point getting a vertical push, creating a crease, and then getting up to the second level. What you see here, you see uh, the left guard doing a great job driving on the linebacker. Uh, you see that they're playing gap and a half here off the double team with the center, and you, the, the center is losing leverage here. In other words, the center has gotten too far over to the play side. He's not driving vertically. He's actually turning – this is turning into what we would just call uh, a body position block. Like, he's not really moving humans. And now that defensive tackle can play a gap and a half. He can play his leverage outside. He can always – he can shuck the center if he wants to and go back into the B gap, but he's complete in, in complete command of the line of scrimmage. You see the right guard 
and right tackle. Right tackle takes a poor first step. So now he it turns into him. He also is now doing a body position block instead of driving that backside defensive tackle. And that's why this this play loses. Yeah. It's an it's an absolute mess, isn't it? I mean, like when you look well, at it's, it, it's, it's it's bad. It, 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 the easiest thing to look at is um, look at the backside tackles footwork. The backside tackle. This time we're not looking at Walter Jones, right? Who's got <laughs> some of the best feet in the history of the world? Okay, so right. when you have to pivot and do these like multiple movements just to go to your left, fundamentally you're just that's bad. That's bad technique, which, you know, for me is like, you're not, you're not being coached, right? You shouldn't be doing that. You're not, you, that's not the type of athlete you are. Like you need to be able to gain ground, gain leverage on your first step towards that defensive tackle. Otherwise you go into contact high, you go into contact weak and you start trying to flip over to the other, the opposite hip of that defensive tackle on the left of your screen. And all of a sudden you're not driving with any force. You're just trying to body this guy off. And again, we're hanging on instead of trying to dominate. Got it. Completely makes sense. I mean, the, the thing that stood out to me, like you just pointed out, was Josh on that right side who actually got benched in this game for Tom. And mm-hmm. then, of course, I, I didn't even notice Josh Myers' lack of leverage there, Mike, until you pointed it out. And you're right. I mean, it it, it to me, it looks like almost like miscommunication. Like these guys weren't expecting – I don't know. <laughs> it just looks like a mess. Well, and, and here's the other thing uh, that we, we don't know the answer to. Just, you know, this is the first time kind of seeing this in a couple months here. Yeah. From a game plan standpoint, you know, a lot of times now you're running wide zone footwork up front with mid zone looks in the backfield and vice versa. Um, the entry point, obviously, is the backside for Jones. You see how the backers are plussed over to that side. Well, why are they doing that? Because they, the, the back is offset to the right and he's in a position where, you know, nine times out of ten, he's going to cross the center's face. There's, you know, every once in a while he'll take the ball straight downhill on like a gap or a counter play. But mo- more often than not, they're going to come across the center space from that point. So they're just in the, the linebackers are already in that insert position. That's the gaps that they own. So the defense makes adjustments for that. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll try to run, run a wide zone and then get the backside cut off kind of horizontally and have Aaron Jones make a cut straight downhill. And then you got to figure out a way to beat the backside defensive end. But yeah, again, we're just we're just looking at it for what it is right now. Right. Yeah. Got it. Good stuff. And and there's so many things that are happening on the fly. Obviously, Aaron's change of protections. He he may you know uh, he may can to a run play, can to a pass play. He may flip the play, uh, like that first play we showed there. It you know when he touched his helmet, I'm going. Did he can to a run or did he flip it? Because you definitely had the numbers game on the left side. But um, it's it's so tough. Like you said, uh, I know everybody's genius is watching it on Sunday, sitting on our couches and going, "Why in the heck did they run?" <laughs> but well, not, even even on that you know even on that first. Even on that first play, Clayton, if if you first of all, you don't really know what Eric could be doing anything. You know, it could be a dummy call. It could, it could be any. It could be it could be telling the, the slot receiver to hey, next time look at this look because we're going to do a certain thing. You know, he there's a lot of other things going on there, and um, I think when you're trying, if you're at home as as a, somebody who doesn't have privy to the headset, you know, I've, it's sometimes better to look at this stuff. Unless you just have a, story, have a lot of historical context to understand the way these guys coach, it's sometimes better just look, look at the play for what it is um, and diagnose that every play is designed to win if you have perfect technique. And so when you lose, it's usually because somebody's getting beat on their 1v1 matchup. Right? In other words, most there's only a handful of schemes during the entire course of the game, six or eight plays, that you lose schematically. Um, most plays are lost because you, you lose a 1v1 matchup, somebody splits a double team, et cetera. So it's a little bit more realistic, I think, as players and as fans to look at, hey, how can I be better technically? How can I be better in my 1v1? Because that's my real value to the team um, than trying to maybe understand, oh, is the coach trying to be too smart here or whatnot? Because at the end of it, it really doesn't matter. There's there's six to eight plays in the game you lose schematically. There's 50 plays in the game you might lose technically. Got it. Makes sense. And I love, you know, what you said on Marcus Eversole's show the other day, you know, talking about uh, Laramie Tunzel and how he's just an absolute professional and a technician and just takes his, I mean, he's out to master the craft and, and doing a, a damn good job at it, man. I, it, it, The more I learn about the game of football, especially offensive line play, Mike, it's, it's not the sexy answer, but I'm going, man, it's all about freaking technique. It is all yeah. about technique. It's just, uh, it's wild. All right, let's move on. So first of all, 
like I said, that third down stuff led to the fourth down, which I think we would all agree probably a crazy call to to choose to go for it on your side of the 50 that early in the ball game, up three to nothing. But the jet sweep gets stuff. They get the ball. They go down. They score, um, and they tie the game up three to three. So now we're going to jump forward to the the uh, toward the end of the first quarter. Two forty six left. It's a third and five. The game is tied three to three at this point. Obviously, the Packers are driving here, and uh, on a third and five, you know you're looking to obviously convert the first down here, try to get in the end zone. You can tell the field starts to shorten a little bit uh, with the you know as you approach the end zone there in that back line. Um, they come out in an eleven gun empty f right boundary. T slot left, and this is going to be a sack by Aiden Hutchinson. I just want to kind of walk through the play. You tell me what you see. Obviously, the first thing that sticks out to me, Mike, is that wide nine on the bottom. That's Aiden Hutchinson. It kind of looks like with that alignment, with them kind of being in that, it looks like a four and a wide nine. They're trying to isolate Aiden on uh, Yash on the right side. It seems like that was the matchup they really wanted to abuse. As we zoom in here, though, just tell me what you see here as we roll through a couple times. The thing that stood out to me, Mike, Watch the right guard, John Runyon. Watch his head snap right here. It's like, okay, I've got to get over here and help my boy Yash, right? <laughs> and as he does that, unfortunately, it's just one of those, I call it bad luck. Maybe you disagree, but Runyon kind of tries to help, and he just shoots Aiden around the corner, right, uh, to hit Aaron. These are, these are, yeah, these are plays. So this is a, a, a slide protection where you see the center is going to go to the – he's sliding to the right. He's – they're looking at – as we look at the screen, they're watching the linebacker on the left out to the slot. So the center has the right – so the left guard and the left tackle have a hard job here. They're going to be on their own. And what we're – and the reason they're doing this in a large part is you want to get kind of a man and a half, a man and a half on each guy. So John Rennan does a good job, takes a short set, pops his hands, tries to stop momentum, and then Myers needs to take over. Uh, Runyon's immediately going to go over and try to bang the hip of, of Hutchinson. What happens really is Bakhtiari gets some, it gives up some inside pressure here. You see coming from the other side, Rogers feels that. What does he usually do? Well, you spin and exit out the other way. And Hutchinson, you know, I mean, listen, Yash is getting bull rushed here, whatever. This isn't a bad, this isn't a terrible job. Sometimes the ball's out by now, sometimes it's not. You never, there's just nowhere else to go. And the worst pressure that you can give up for a guy like Aaron is if you're getting pressured through the B gap at the left tackle position right here, cause he's going to sense that he might be, you know, he's a right-handed quarterback. He's going to sense that on his inside shoulder and his exit options are you can't go forward anymore because you're going to run into this pressure. So you have to exit, you have to wheel back around, go back out the other side, outside, outside the, uh, the left side of the pocket. And when he does that, it's real easy for a guy like Aiden Hutchinson, who's if anything is a real high motor guy, he's going to be able to run around and sometimes make this play. This is just, these things happen in the game sometimes. Sometimes the sometimes the ball's gone by now. But when you feel that inside pressure and that B gap off of the left tackle side right here, you can see why he tries to spit out, go around yeah. the other side. I see that, yeah. So it's actually, yeah, with Bach kind of getting that, giving that inside leverage there makes complete and, sense. And, and I think I counted four and a half seconds uh, to the point where it was, it was roughly one, two, three. Yeah, four and a half when they got to Aaron. Like you said, the ball – in the NFL, the ball's got to be out, right? If it's going to come out. Yeah, but you, you know, if you, if you, like four and a half seconds, it's you know, as he's turning and doing all this other stuff. Usually, you're trying to talk about when you talk about two and a half seconds. It's usually with a clean pocket, right? So it's it's time to throw with a clean pocket, not necessarily as they're scrambling around. I think all bets are off at that point. Got it. Got it. And the other thing I noticed too, he's trying to trying to look at Lazard across the middle, and that throwing lane's just not there, right? I mean, they that that pocket is really starting to starting to collapse. So that's tough, man. Tough. But again, kudos to Detroit. They came out, uh, they were ready to go and and absolutely dominated the trenches this game. Um, I know a lot of people gave bad grades to the offensive line. I don't think anyone graded out well in this game. Um, as from the from the Packers standpoint, it just seemed like the Lions were we're ready to go. Let's fast forward now to the second quarter, 13-16 left in the second quarter, a third and five. Green Bay is up six to three, believe it or not. And uh, they come out in an 11-gun tray, F wide left. Once again, they're looking to os do some kind of oscillation. They've got Tunyon flexed out down here in this 11-personnel mm -hmm. set. They get the halfback week. And this is going to be another sack by Aiden Hutchinson as he beats Yash. Let's just kind of take a look at the play as it develops, first of all. And then we're going to go to the box. As we go to the box, you'll notice on the right side, once again, man, they really utilized that wide nine, didn't they, Mike? Well, the, you can see on both sides, they're just – they're running two wide threes or four eyes even. 
and then trying to get those guys out wide because usually what happens when you put players out wide, offensive linemen try to get there too fast and they create a really bad – like it's – it's I call it geometry of the pocket. And you just – you're creating real bad angles for yourself and making it very difficult um, to get beat inside, to just not get to your confrontation point under control and these defensive ends can – you know, they're better athletes than you. And you see that's what's happening here with, with Josh. Josh takes two. He turns immediately. His feet get vertical. Once your feet get vertical, your chest – your chest – feet gets vertical, your chest turns toward the sideline. Now really that defensive end has really a three-way go. He can go through you. He can go back inside, in which case you have to pivot open. You can't get there. That's what the case in point here with, with Aiden Hutchinson. But most of this, when you lose as an offensive lineman, like 99% of the time you lose before you even touch the guy. And his uh, Yasha's feet are, are bad here. That's why he loses. Um, Sometimes it, it, it really is a – you know, it's funny when, when I – when I see on uh, social media and I see all these, these new guys trying to coach linemen and everything they talk about and replacing and winning with hands and winning with, and doing all this, you know, fancy stuff and all these fancy drills. And I, I, I work with some of the, you know, top, you know, multiple top 10 guys in the league. And all we talk about is your footwork and your body position. And we, we obviously do work hands, but the only thing that really matters in these confrontations are, your footwork, initial footwork, footwork into your real estate spot, your, your competition zone, and then what your body position is. And it doesn't really matter how good your hands are, or what moves you can work off, double scissors, chops, et cetera. Like all of that really doesn't matter if your body position's right. But if your body position's wrong, like you see here, you're just hanging on and hoping the quarterback gets rid of the ball. Yeah. And obviously it didn't happen. Um, I think I counted – it was a little less than three seconds. Hard to, you know, hard to tell when you're breaking it down that much. But I see what you're saying about Yasha's Yasha's feet kind of getting vertical there. I mean, he was, yeah, makes complete sense. It kind of you see the different. If you see the difference over, oh, sorry, Clint, but if you see the difference between Bakhtiari, Bakhtiari, the way he explodes out of his stance. Now he's very unorthodox the way he does a lot of things, but the way he's he's able to explode out of the stance and then he kind of settles. And so that you see, it's not about. Um, with with Bach on this particular player, most ninety percent of the plays he does, ninety nine percent of the plays he does, it's about getting to back to a point where you're taking all the options away from the defensive end. The defensive end playing against Bakhtiari on this side right now, he probably had an idea of what he wanted to do on this play. And the fact is, Bach just is so good at getting back and then kind of settling into a very comfortable body position and footwork position, where. He's, this guy's run out of options. He's too high. If he tries to run the loop, which he does right now, just push him right by. He can't use any of those kind of attack the shoulder moves because Bakhtiari's in too good of a position. And so he either can, A, run by the play. This is a give-up play from the defensive, the defensive end lost this rep over on the on the left side of the screen. Or yeah. he can bull rush him, which is exactly what Bakhtiari wants to do. And that's the genius of being a real good footwork technician in the National Football League at the tackle position. You win before you even touch the guy, or in this case with the Ash, you lose before you even touch the guy. God, it, I see exactly what you're saying there with Bach on the left. I mean, he's be quick, but don't get in a hurry. The dude never panics, and he's just patient, patient, patient. Bang, beautiful play. And I see you can see the difference in the footwork, man. Good stuff, my dude. This is why we've got you on instead of my dumb redneck butt trying to break it down. I love it, man. Love it. Um, all right, let's move on. So again, Green Bay was leading six to three at that point. Now let's fast forward to the fourth quarter. Um, Green Bay's still leading. There's 14.55 left. It's a third and six play. Like I said, Green Bay up 16 to 13. Packers come out in 11 gun trips. Nub flex, halfback saying this is going to be another sack. Uh, this time, uh, if you'll notice, uh, the pre well, I'm sorry, the previous play, Dobbs actually had that deep drop. So we're kind of coming down to the wire now, running out of options. And, um, you know, it, you could just feel the momentum building the entire game. Mike, we led the majority of the game, but it just never felt like, okay, we're comfortable with this. It just, it, it just kept building and building. After that Dobbs drop, this right here is a, uh, a left side pressure. Let's just kind of roll the tape here again out of the gun. And once again, that is a third and six play that we're watching here. And, mm -hmm. and to me right here, Aaron, as you can see, nobody's really open. They've got kind of that rat underneath taken away his uh his safety valve there underneath on the on the little dig and as we go to the box cam let's kind of watch it unfold here from the left side what do you see here with this play mike because i mean these guys have got a double team but that that pocket's still getting pushed right with bach and and uh and our boy elton what are you seeing here on this play as well, far you, as see, you see uh, you know what's happening a lot in the national football league right you see that the, the two shell the two safety high look Mm -hmm. um, six, really six in the box. You have your, your you have your X receiver in tight, so it looks like there might be seven. But it's really six in the box. Play everybody's dropping. They know it's going to be a pass. Um, 
the middle of the field's wide open and there's nobody there's nobody coming into the window immediately. You, you would expect in these situations, you'd see somebody try to find the window. And so Aaron's got to make, you know, this longer throw to the sideline, which he's more than capable of making. But that's where your eyes go. You see guys coming in the middle now, but it's a little bit like the timing's just a little bit off because he had to move his feet. When we look in the pocket one more time, if you can go back. Yeah. Again, you got this wide position. So let's just take the left side of the offensive line. So the left tackle, knowing that, um, Jenkins has to go really set out and try to get to a wide four. Now, Elgin Jenkins is a, is a, is a real flat setter, okay? And the problem with flat setting in these situations is once I get, again, we're, it's just about getting to your real estate spot, right? So Octary does a great job of going vertical and trying to hold this off in case they run a TE. But because Jenkins is so flat, he's not really taking a lot off this defensive tackle. So it's very easy for the defensive tackle to now to – push both on Bakhtiari while being pushed by Jenkins because there's no real, mm -hmm. let's say, vertical press back towards the line of scrimmage from Jenkins. He just takes a really tight angle. And so he's kind of trying to push him out instead of trying to push him back to where he came from. Okay. So just from a like a vector idea, this doesn't it's a very difficult way to pass block. Okay. And so you've got one guy kind of going flat to block his guy and another guy going vertical. Well it's very easy for that defensive tackle to push on the vertical. And what happens, you just start creating a little bit more pressure. Aaron feels that pressure. They end up do running a, a kind of a TE game here late. And while it is picked up, you see what the quarterback feels is really just a function of – if Elton Jenkins just does like what we call a line set and sets a little bit more vertically, he can keep that guy wide and kind of keep – use his, his strength, his athleticism, his technique to push that guy away and not really make Bakhtiari feel like he's got to take – both the defensive tackle and then be able to drive back on that defensive end, or excuse me, as the defensive end comes underneath. And when you're talking about a TE, you're talking about the the outside edge defender. He's out of that wide nine. He's going to loop back around, right? Yeah. So so TE is a tackle end game. So if I say ET, it's an end tackle game. So end goes is like the penetrator, and TE the the three technique, the four eye right here in this case, the defensive tackle. He's the penetrator, and then the the end is a looper. Got it. Love it. And he ends Love up, it. you see here, he ends up, sorry, he ends up not coming around. The end just keeps coming, but they're running the game and they're into that, that high B gap look where this could be a T. That's why Bakhtiari has got to kind of stay there and hold that position because if they come back around, he's got to be able to drive on that tackle. Does that make sense? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news. So don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event. Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. And again, that was a... Uh... A third and six play there in the fourth quarter. Green Bay was up sixteen to thirteen. The pressure gets to Aaron. tries to tries to run out of the, you know, scramble up the middle. It looked like he wanted to hit Lazard there across the middle again. And you're right, man. There is nothing there. The, the the middle of the field's wide open. Which we had Coach Haddad, um, great high school coach. He, he and his father and his brother coach uh, up up in the northeast, up in the Massachusetts area. And he was kind of talking about this, like you know, when you're playing quarters coverage, if it's true quarters, you want to attack the middle of the field. And there's just nobody attacking the middle of the field. And look, the other thing too, Mike. Look at the the receivers in the upper right. How they're just all kind of bunched together, right? Yeah, that, a lot that's, of usually, that. that's usually that's usually a sign that something's gone wrong with communication, right? There's right. that's you, you would imagine that's not that shouldn't be the case. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, and you see it again here in a minute. I'm pretty sure. Um, actually, it was it was on one of the other gun plays. We just zoomed in on the line, which that's okay. Um, all right, let's move on to the final play. This is the one that Aaron caught a lot of heat for, Mike. Um, this was the interception at the end of the game, and and all you heard fans saying was he's playing hero ball. He's playing hero ball. Or I'm gonna check time. Yeah, we're we're over on time. We got to get you out of here. Let's let's hit this real quick. We're good. Um, it was. This is a third and 10. There's 337 left in the fourth quarter. Detroit's now winning 20 to 16. And, you know, again, all you heard on social media, this is hero ball. This is just mm -hmm. Aaron playing hero ball. But when I watched it back, I mean, in real time too, Mike, of course, here's the pick by Kirby Joseph. When I watched it back in real time, the first thing I noticed was A.J. Dillon, right? And when you when you notice this protection breakdown, I mean, this is where, – where's Aaron going with the ball? Obviously, he's going to have an option across the middle, but he, he doesn't have a throwing lane, right? We're waiting for Lazard to kind of un uncover here across the middle. What are you seeing here? Am I am I looking at it wrong? What do you think happened on this protection when it comes to obviously AJ Dillon's in the backfield uh, to protect? Did Myers make the mistake there? Did Runyon make the mistake? Did Dillon make the mistake, or was this just a good play call by Detroit? Well, one way or another, they're going to have too many guys coming. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think that's that's the first thing you got to look at. So even if you if you're leaving in, um, who's that down on the left side? That is who a tight end is that? Deguara. Not, that's Tunyon. Tunyon. Is that Tunyon? Okay, so Tunyon's in the game. So if they're gonna if they're gonna run up in Green Dog on Tunyon, which means he, they're 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 running up and essentially hitting him. So they're gonna run. They're gonna make his whoever's covering him make him part of the, the rush scheme. <clears throat> Usually, in this case, you would think AJ Dillon's gonna go from the left side of the center over. So you think he's gonna pick up this looper? He's seeing something over there that makes him think he needs to. He needs to pick up Tunyon's guy or be part of that protection. It looks like he might have made a mental error here. I don't know because you know we're not we're not privy to the the huddle call. But you right. see who's running free. They just they just ran a a, tw a kind of a, a double dog game where you bring the the play side linebacker down in the in the A or the B gap, and then you run the backside guy across the center space. So the center and the right guard are accounting for the the man on the on the right guard's right to, on the second level. Um, this like this is a this is you know clearly a protection issue. They have enough guys. Um, I, if, if looking at it now, they do have enough guys to block this. Uh, they just have a protection issue with communication. Um, and this is what happened. I mean, listen, this is what, kind of what happens when you play against teams that are just really, really hard chargers, um, play with a lot of intensity, really want to beat you. And sometimes the intensity level and everything kind of gets the better of you in these moments. We don't know what the communication is. This seems like a pretty cr cut and dry play now that we're looking at it again, Clayton. Uh, yeah. that that AJ should be able to track this guy back. I don't know what was made in the in, in the huddle. I don't know if Tony is right now looking to be that. It looks like he's trying to be that bump in early release right here and thinking he's going to make that, that play. Weird. They had done this with some success, right, in the course of the last couple of games of the season. Um, but, you know, this is, I'll say this. This season is going to be a lot different having those Luke Musgrave <laughs> and, and it's going to be a lot different in a, in a number of ways. Because you're going to, you have a bona fide, like six foot five, fast, athletic, physical tight ends that if they can be part, a little bit more part of the run game as well and the protection game, you're just going to get so much more, um, so many more clear looks, so many more area opportunities. Because like in that situation right there, if, if you know, at the end of the, at the end of his career in Green Bay, Teddy was basically a check down guy, like uh, maybe because he can't block, so he would kind of maybe I'll, I'll. I'll hit the guy with the shoulder on the way out and then I'll open up and that's how I get a lot of my yards. Whereas you're going to get guys now that he'll just run, you know, like Luke Musgrave would just run away from that. See, he comes <laughs> right. down close. It, 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 it makes it really easy. Right. So yeah. there's a lot of things that they're doing there that just from a personnel standpoint, I think limit them. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's why you see the, the huge investment in the, in the tight ends in the early rounds in, in, in uh, green Bay's draft. But speaking specifically on that play, uh, you know, hero ball. Let's see. The, the great thing about the NFL and every, all this stuff is like fans can sit here and watch every single play and talk about it. it and the players, I'm just telling you from firsthand experience, like we could care less what what is being said about, you know, Aaron's making, right. Aaron's doing the best job he can and trying to make something happen. And, and what everybody else says, it's like, you just got to take, that's part of the game. Everybody, obviously you want everybody to love you, but if it's not that, if that's not the situation, which is almost impossible, mm -hmm. um, what you're trying to do is gain the respect of, of, of your teammates and your coaches trying to make the right decisions. And I think what you've seen the last couple of years, especially last year, especially is if you don't have the right people in place, 
and you're used to having success, um, especially with the young coaching staff uh, that has never really, you know, Matt's never been a, a head coach without a Hall of Fame quarterback. Right. You don't really know what that's going to look like. He never had a top five offense, you know, without a Hall of Fame quarterback. We don't really know what that looks like when all of a sudden you don't you don't necessarily have some Devontae Adams, some of the pieces in place, some of the things that Aaron usually relies on. And it'll be really interesting to see this year what that offense looks like when you have, I would argue, maybe a more inexperienced but a more talented skill room from the tight ends to the running backs to the yeah. to the wide receivers, obviously minus Devontae, but you don't have nearly the experience or the talent level at the court at the most important position in, in the game. Right. So um, I'm interested to see how this plays out. Obviously, they need to make some improvements along the offensive line. The offensive line took a huge step back last year. I don't think, you know, and, and I think they're a very uh, talented offensive line, particularly on the left side. Um, but Josh Myers has to have a bounce back year. John Rennie needs to keep improving. Whatever they decide to do, if it's Tom, if it's Josh over on the right side, um, both those guys have things they can they can get better at. But you need to just take advantage of what you have from a personnel standpoint. I don't know if they did a great job of that last year. Certainly, they have more options with the with the tight end. I can't tell you how important the tight end position is in that offense in this NFL in this day and age with what they can bring to the table with uh, running against defenses. So I'm really interested and excited to see that, bro. But some of these stuff, some of the stuff last year, it's like AJ makes a mistake. There's a lot going on. It, you you don't know pre snap are they panicking or they just haven't. Is it a communication error with the center? Like you just you really just don't know, and that's what's that's what's hard about the game. Sometimes you have no idea what was called in the huddle at the line of scrimmage. Maybe AJ you know shed some light on it at the end, at the end of the season after the game, but you know just just going blank there. You know AJ doesn't make a lot of mistakes mentally, so right. it's tough to say. Yeah, absolutely. It's and you know I when I highlight these type of things, especially with Aaron, we all know it's a touchy subject. You know, first of all, as Packer fans, we're not allowed to talk about it all of a sudden, but which cracks me up. Um, the the thing that I'm kind of the the picture I'm trying to paint for everybody is, hey, listen, if this was going on with Aaron here, let's let's take into consideration Jordan's at the helm now. It you know just like it was not all Aaron's fault, it's not going to just be all Jordan's fault. Let's kind of understand okay what's going on, and without understanding the call and the huddle, like you said, it's uh it's so hard. But hey, that's what we do as fans, Mike. We uh, we like to pretend like we know more than we do, and uh, <laughs> and it gets a little heated out here. So um, I appreciate your time, and I wanted to ask you about camp, but we're over on time. We'll do it another time. Yeah, um, go ahead. I got I got ten minutes. You got ten minutes. All right. I want to ask you this because the biggest thing that blew up last time you were on was just you talking camp stories, talking about what it was like in your first camp and, and, you know, talking about going out with the guys and this and that. Let me ask you this. I heard you, I heard you tell one specific story to Marcus Everson. And if you want to repeat that, that, repeat that, that's cool. If there's another camp story you've got in mind, that's awesome too. The one you specifically told to Marcus was about Ryan Longwell sitting with the offensive line and having a rookie mm. old lineman coming in. You care to tell our listeners that again? You don't have to go into too much detail. Sure, but. It, you know it wasn't even really a camp story. It was uh, um, how much we loved and respected Ryan Longwell. You know, who was you know obviously the, the, a great kicker for the Packers for a long time. What a, and what a great guy and what a great family he has. But uh, on, you know, Green Bay was a, was a place where there's not there wasn't rookie hazing back in the '90s. You know, in the early 2000s, that was prevalent in some other places. That wasn't prevalent here. A lot of these guys were expected to to come in and, and win and, and and help you win win football games, win championships. We just had a different mindset, I think, up in Green Bay, with especially when I got there with Mike Holmgren and then carrying on with Sherman later on. But Ryan, you know, Ryan was welcome. You know, we golf with Ryan. We we you know, joke around with Ryan. And obviously, long snappers, kickers, punters, they have kind of have their own schedule. They're on their own thing. But you know, if they were at lunch and they were sitting, you know, there wasn't like an O line table where it was just you know we're going to be. Uh, exclusionary and not allow real people to come in and, and sit down. But, you know, the, the, the culture of the culture of football has always been macho, tough guy. Even when guys really aren't tough guys, they act like tough guys because you know, there's this inherent fear of violence and everything that try to people try to get up for and they try to create this persona. Right. So right. Ryan was sitting us with us at dinner one or excuse me, at lunch one day. And this, I think he was a fifth or sixth round pick from San Diego state. I forget the guy's name. He, he, he made a comment to Ryan Longwell to, you know, get off, get, get away from our table. This is the O line table, kind of in a tough guy thing. And Ryan's like year six at this point, he's our boy. Right. And I just remember uh, at that moment, that, that poor, that poor offensive lineman from San Diego state, he didn't know it yet, but he was <laughs> off the team already. 
Yeah. Because you know, <laughs> LeBron was a hard guy. He wasn't. He was just some rookie who got was lucky enough to get drafted to to Lambeau Field. Right. He he, he was he was nobody to us. He hadn't proven anything. And Ryan was a, a proven commodity and and a guy that we really valued and respected as a teammate and as a friend. And it was it was just funny because you you always see this uh, you know seek taken mentality, tough guy stuff from from a lot of these college kids. And you know the truth is, once you get up to the the, the pro level, it's like, hey, we're all grown men with mortgages and, and families and right. you know, trying to run households. And oh, by the way, we happen to be really good at our jobs that we take very seriously. But the, all that tough guy stuff is thrown out. You know, is, is, is that's not a real thing. Tough guys don't have to act that way. So the minute that he said that, uh, he was off the team. And he just didn't know it yet. And, but I, I'll tell you what, he had, he had a rough couple of days. And I think, I don't think he was there for maybe more than another week. That's, that's a why I heard that story. And I was just like, and, you know, immediately you want to go, okay, who, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think back who would it, would it might've been and, and this and that, it doesn't even matter, but it just goes to show like once you earn the respect of your teammates, especially at the pro level, like you guys are, you're in it together. I mean, I just heard the other day, I had no idea. And, and I watched football. I felt like I watched it closely at the time, but Marco Rivera, right. I didn't realize he was in NFL Europe for a while. Right. Like he didn't, he go over there for a year. Am I thinking Mark, Marco? I think Marco after his, so what, it, what used to happen is, and I think Marco was a later on, maybe a six or seven round draft pick. Right. And what used to happen is after your rookie year, and I wasn't there yet, but I just know because this, this is happening during my rookie year as well. If you did, if you weren't playing a lot and they wanted to get you time, there was no better place than NFL Europe. Um, there, I think you got to play eight games, so you'd fly over there. The, the NFL coaches or former coaches, you know, would be over there, and and look, it was just a matter of getting reps in in game situations. Um, it's really, you know, it's what the XFL and the USFL. That's what they've they've been trying to do. They're trying to recreate a place where you don't have to be in college. You can go somewhere else and get what we'll call it professional experience. You know, you right. seem, you see the same thing in, in the NBA with the G league soccer leagues. There's always a division two league that you can go get, get more reps in. I know the MLS is doing that with MLS two now. And it's just a really great opportunity for guys that are projects to, to go get these reps. And, you know, sure there's some, there's, there's now with, with, you know, how many snaps are you getting? How many games you're actually playing during the season? Like, there's so much to think about as far as like how much football is too much football in the one calendar year. Yeah. But for guys that aren't playing a lot and they, and they're trying to make a roster guys like Marco at the time. Yeah, certainly that you know, I, I would, I would imagine that he would say that was a good experience for him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you guys, like I said, everybody's trying to take every opportunity they can get to get better, to put a name, you know, get a name for themselves. And then you have someone come in and just all of a sudden they, the seat's taken. It ain't working. Not, not with this bunch. I love it, man. I, I heard that story and I, I laughed out loud. I was like, that's just wild. How, I don't know, that fraternity, right? That, uh, that brotherhood that you guys have. And I'm sure you still communicate with those guys on a regular basis. It's just so cool, man. I love football, Mike. It's got me by the soul. Dude. It's got me by the soul. I love it. It's, um, a, fun, I can't it's, think it's a fun sport. It, it really is a fun sport. I, I hope, I hope that, uh, I know we're not getting the participation of the youth level now, and I actually applaud that. I don't think people need to be playing when they're younger because there's only so many hits you should be taking on this. On this, yeah, it's not going to yours before maybe high school, but gosh darn it, it's a fun sport. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. You're the best, dude. I can't thank you enough. Thank you for taking time away from your family to hang out with us, man. It's it's always a hit, dude. We always learn something, and uh, thanks for putting us in check on the tape, man, and going, hey, look, we don't know everything, right? We're not in the huddle, so appreciate you, buddy. You got it. All right, that was Mike Wall from Process to Perform, former offensive lineman for the Green Bay Packers, Pro Bowl. My man is just uh, absolutely phenomenal. Appreciate him taking time. Like I said, guys, he's on vacation. He's out there in San Diego and said, hey, man, yeah, let's 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 get up in the morning and talk ball. Got on here at 7 a.m. Pacific time to, uh, to make that happen. So, you guys, make sure you go give him a follow on Twitter, show him some love. Um, just an absolute monster in the run game for the Packers back in the day. So, again, we wanted to do kind of a little different chalk talk segment there. As I'm going through and watching that Detroit Lions game, I'm going, man, what really went wrong? Because you guys know how it is. You're watching the game. You're frustrated on this play, that play. And then you look back, and it's just everything's foggy, right? Everything is foggy. And, and, and you're trying to understand what went wrong. Guys, we can't – things can't get better. And, and I like to approach this podcast – this YouTube channel, Packers Total Access, I want to approach it from a from a sense of us understanding the game at another level, right? And and we haven't arrived, as you could tell, we're we're way far behind when it comes to people who's actually played the game. 
But we have these folks that are out there that are willing to come in and explain it. Why, rather than us trying to act like know-it-alls and, uh, and Monday morning quarterbacks, right, let's have people who have been in the trenches, people who have been in the meeting rooms, people who know exactly what the game is about, come in and teach us. And, and there's no better teacher than Mike Wall. So uh, really appreciate everybody hanging out with us. Again, just wanted to hop on here, break down that tape, say, okay, what went wrong on those crucial plays? Like I said, I um, wanted to point out that you know, on a play where Aaron Jones gained nine yards, it, it wasn't pretty, right? It wasn't, it wasn't perfect. And that kind of explains why that yards per carry can be deceptive at times as far as when it comes to schematically, people playing schematically sound in, in that regard. Now, obviously, we had the third and one play there in the first quarter stuff that led to the jet sweep call. There's one thing I'll say, don't agree with the fourth down call when they went on the field. Of course, if they had got it, I wouldn't even be talking about it right now. We may even win the game, right? But hindsight's 2020. I know when the call was made, it was like, what are we doing going for it on fourth down on our side of the 50 in the first quarter with the season on the line? And then, you know, a lot of people obviously disagree with the jet sweep call there to Alan Lazard, um, which, you know, I know people are like, who in the world, why in the world would you run a jet sweep? Guys, that's LaFleur's offense. You know, it's it's meant to be deceptive. It's meant to uh, to kind of give the same kind of looks. And uh, like they said on the play callers, right? You're you're creating complexity with the, or you're you're creating simplicity with the illusion of complexity, right? You want to make things look complex, although they're very simple. And we just kind of outthought ourselves there. There was, I think, there was, uh, I believe, three jet sweeps called in the first quarter in that Lions game, guys. It was one of the worst offensive performances we had all year, from a Packers standpoint, and it was more of quote unquote LaFleur's offense than we've ever seen. And that's not to knock LaFleur. That's not to knock the game plan. It's not to say it's not going to work this year. It's just we keep hearing we haven't seen LaFleur's offense. And I just want to kind of help people understand this. Here's what the tape's showing, right? And uh it's not to dunk on anyone. It's not to try to prove anyone wrong. It's for all of us to be better fans and more educated fans and go, okay, that guys, there were so many times this year. I went back and watched the tape and was like, man, I I was completely wrong tweeting that during <laughs> during the game live, right? We've all been guilty of it. Um, but it's just all about getting better and learning. And and I'm really excited. Like Mike said, man, we don't we don't know what to expect with this Packers team and this Packers offense this year, especially with people like Luke Musgrave. I'm so excited to see him flexed out wide. And uh, I, I would really like to see him personally. I would like to see him take on Alan Lazard's role. He's quick enough. He's fast enough to do that. If he can prove he's got the hands for it, um, I think he can be uh, uh, more well equipped than Alan Lazard was to play that kind of that bully slot at times. And and you, you, well, you had the flyer wide receiver in this Matt Lafleur offense. Um, it's amazing people still can't explain exactly what that means, but we talk about it all the time. Um, you got all that Z motion where the Z actually ends up being the slot. So it's like, okay, is that technically the slot? You've seen that a lot with Lazard. I'm hoping Musgrave can kind of fill that role, and it's all going to come down to him grabbing this offense. But, again, man, just to kind of walk you through that, that that third down stuff that led to the jet sweep, the failed jet sweep on fourth down, that came with 9-16 left in the first quarter. We were leading three to nothing. You punt that ball away, whole different ball game there. Uh, in the first quarter, 246 left. We had a third and five. It was a 3-3 tie there. That's where Yash gets beat by Aiden Hutchinson. Of course, Mike done a great job breaking that down. That stalled that drive out. Second quarter, 13-16 left, third and five. Green Bay still up six to three. Aiden Hutchinson beats Yash again for another sack. That's why you've seen Zach Tom come into that, that game later on. It may have been injury-related. I'm not 100% sure, but we're seeing in camp that it seems like at least early on, just two, two, two and a half practices in, um, that Tom has taken the majority of the first team reps at right tackle. It looks like they're kind of picking up where they left off when they ended up benching Yash. And, and again, Yash is, in my opinion, a great a great tackle to have there to play swing. If he doesn't beat Tom out for right tackle, it's nice to have him to fill in left tackle or right tackle in a pinch. And I kind of feel like Yash plays left tackle better than right tackle, right? Um, and then, of course, we had the uh, – in the four, fourth quarter, 14-55 left, another third and uh, sixth play. Green Bay still leading – uh, 16 to 13, you get that left side pressure where he talked about them running that that end game and that looping blitz there um, where uh, Aaron was kind of forced to scramble. Uh, the previous play there, of course, you had – and I wanted these notes because I didn't want it to just come down like this play is what screwed it up. I wanted to kind of give you that jet sweep to Lazard and set the play up like, hey, look, this is what happened on the following play. Well, the play before, 
that pressure in the fourth quarter with 1455 left. Um, that left side pressure that led to the scramble and, and obviously the uh, the failed conversion. Um, the previous play was where Dobbs uh, dropped that deep pass where, uh, if I remember correctly, Aaron just threw a whole shot and it was right on the money, hit Dobbs in the hands and dropped. Listen, it's easy for me to 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 bash someone for dropping a pass and I'm sitting on my couch and it's 70 degrees in my house. They're out there playing in single digits or, or the teams, whatever it is. Um, but it is what it is. It's If you see it, you got to say it. And we got to understand exactly what went right, what went wrong, so we can we can know where the team kind of needs to go and to come from that perspective like, okay, here – here is what happened last year. Here's truly what happened. Rather than we just don't run the ball, guys, we just showed you in this play, third and one, you know, running running the rock to Aaron Jones and then coming back and running a jet, you know, that jet sweep. You know, Aaron had Aaron Jones had his, uh, his highest statistical yards, uh, you know, as far as rushing yards last year of his entire career from what I understand. What, what do you mean we're not running the ball, right? Like, I don't know, I just, I just kind of seen that different. And then, of course, you had that fourth quarter play where we talked about that 11 gunch, 11 gun bunch uh, play there on third and 10. You're already backed up in the third and 10. It's not an ideal situation. Hindsight, yes, you want to see Aaron try to check that down in the Y leak there to Tunyon off the left side. But again, live bullets flying. Um, it's easier said than done. Like Mike pointed out, you know, as we watch it back, it, it just seems like AJ Dillon kind of kind of missed that block. And it's not to put all the blame on him, it's just to point out, look. It wasn't hero ball. This isn't to defend Aaron because if, the reason I say that, guys, if Jordan Love, who I'm rooting for 110% this year, right, if he comes out and gets that same exact look and that same blocking breakdown, you're going to get a similar result. Now, yes, Jordan has fresher legs, and we hope he can scramble. We hope he can make things happen with his legs too. But it's it's identifying, hey, here's what went wrong. And like Mike pointed out from, from that whole different perspective, we don't know what the call was in the huddle. Aaron may have specifically told AJ when they came to the line, hey, look, just slide left. Just slide left. Watch the left, right? So that could have been on Aaron. We don't truly know. But to just sit here and say, ah, oh, he's playing hero ball, I don't want people saying that about Jordan Love, right? So we got to be fair. we got to be honest and say, hey, here's what the tape showed. And to me, it was a blocking breakdown. And if you guys remember, Matt LaFleur caught absolute hell in the postgame press conference. Why did he catch hell? Because he said it was a blocking it was a blocking breakdown. Everybody's oh, there he is defending Aaron Rodgers, right? No, he wasn't. He was being honest. There was a blocking breakdown, whether it was AJ Dillon, whether it was miscommunication from Aaron to AJ, or it was someone who you know maybe Myers was supposed to protect that gap a little bit more and AJ pick up the nose. I doubt that. There's not many blocking schemes that are specifically designed to let that that zero or that one tech through to the running back, right? Only for the center to maybe pick up a dog blitz. So. Um, that's just kind of how we've seen it. Again, it's hard to go back and watch that tape, but we're burying the game tape now. I just wanted to kind of point that out because what triggered this in my mind, guys, was last week on Wildey and Tausch, they had Brian Belaga. I wanted to ask uh, Mike if he had heard that, which I'm he's so busy training and everything. I'm sure he hasn't. Uh, Brian Bulaga, former Packers offensive lineman, he said the same exact thing. The offense under the offensive line underperformed last year. You know, and we kind of look at this offensive line like, oh, they're great. You know, you heard me and Andy Herman talking on this podcast about how they've got 12 offensive linemen returning that's that's uh, that's been on the 53 man roster in their career. Right. That that seems like a, a lot of uh, a lot of experience. But at the end of the day, when you look at how they perform, when you go back and watch the tape, the right side of that line is suspect. Let's hope Tom, Zach Tom, with a full training camp under him can take that right tackle position and just put it to bed and say, hey, look, I'm going to hold the fort down over here. Now it's going to come down to can Myers step up this year along with John Runyon at that right guard position. I'm excited for the season. I'm excited to see how it unfolds. And, again, we're burying that tape. Just wanted to go back and kind of watch it and say, hey, guys, here, here is what actually happened in that Lions game in crucial situations, one, two, three, four, five different crucial third downs where – the, uh, the blocking was suspect, or at least the scheme was suspect, or the communication was suspect um, in, in that regard. So let's hope things get simplified. I know the starting QB said that last year, and he got butchered for it, but this may be what he was talking about. I wanted to ask Mike that, but again, we went over on time and really appreciate him taking time to hang out with us. So thank you guys for watching on YouTube and Twitter. For those of you listening on the pod, hopefully we illustrated this enough to kind of give you an idea of, okay, it's. I know you can't see the video on the pod, but hopefully you come away going, oh, okay, that makes sense as to why that happened. That's the whole purpose of these uh, specific shows. So thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world and go, Pat, go. For Jordan Love. 
Watson, 37. Here he is throwing in the middle. It's caught by Watson. He's got great speed. Turning the corner. Christian Watson down the sideline. And he will score. Whoa. Hang on. Love to Watson. To a one-score game. This one is the stunner. You basically feel like, all right, this Eagles team sort of has this thing under control. And then Christian Watson hits the Jets again. Six touchdowns now in the last three games. He is really something. When he gets in the open field and running, that was some throw by Jordan Love, too.